welcome to the new video. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you how to disassemble a 6502 Commodore binary or PRG file. The program I'll be disassembling is going to be this Space Invaders clone that ran on the Commodore PET. Now, I was pretty young when the PET first came out. The first time I saw these things, I didn't know anything about computers. I just assumed they were home Space Invaders consoles and I loved them. And when I finally got a Commodore PET, the very first thing I did was play Space Invaders. So it's near and dear to my heart, that's why I chose that. Now, before we actually get into the mechanics of disassembling a binary, I wanted to walk through what it means to actually disassemble a binary. To do that, you'll have to have an understanding of what it means to assemble a binary, so I'll cover that. To understand assembly, you're gonna have to understand the difference between assembly language and machine language, so I'll start there. Let's get started. Machine language, or machine code, is what the 6502 CPU processes when it's running. It's a stream of 8-bit values that tell the processor what operation it should execute and on which value or memory location to operate. The animation here shows a Kim1 single board computer ingesting machine code and outputting Hello World. The Kim1's a great system for me to introduce you to machine language because the native programming environment on the Kim1 uses machine language. Let's write a Hello World program for the Kim1 so you can see 6502 machine language in action. The Kim1 user manual has a section on writing an application in Chapter 5. I'll use that as a guide for writing a Hello World program. This looks like a good place to start. The Kim1 manual suggests four steps here, but for our purposes we can ignore steps 1 and 3. Now writing the assembly language and then generating the machine language, that'll be enough to clarify the differences between the two for this video. This table at figure 5.4 will perfectly illustrate the relationship of assembly language and machine language. Let's walk through writing our Hello World program for the Kim1 and assembly language together. The program will be a simple loop that reads the string data from memory one byte at a time and echoes each character as it's read. So the program starts by initializing the X index register to zero, and since it's the start of our program, I used the start label there. The next thing I'll need to do is read our data beginning wherever it lives using the X index as an offset. I use the loop label here because it's the start of our read loop. I'll load each byte into the accumulator, so I'm using the LDA instruction. And since this is assembly language and not machine language, we can use a label instead of an address if we want to. So I'm using data here as where we're going to be reading from. Rather than using a loop counter, I'm going to use a null terminated string like one does when programming in C. Wherever our hello world string goes in memory, I'll make sure I shove a null or zero byte at the end of the string, and our code will know it's done reading the string when it encounters this null byte. This line is what checks for that null byte. BEQ means branch on equal, but what it's really doing is checking if the zero processor status flag is set, which it will be when the accumulator has a zero loaded into it. So if we read that zero byte, we want to branch to the end of our program, so the end label will be the operand to our branch instruction here. If we didn't read a null byte, we read one of the characters from the text string, hello world. So we want to echo that. So JSR or jump subroutine to the Kim1's altch kernel routine, which will do that for us. After that, we just have to increment the X index register and go back to the top of our loop. Easy. We have an end and a data label up there in our code that go nowhere. So I'll stick a break instruction at the next line here and that will serve as our end. And lastly, the data label will go at the end of our program, and that's where the hello world string will go. Now I'll walk through converting the assembly language into machine language. So I mentioned during the assembly language part that we didn't have to concern ourselves with memory locations. With machine language, we do, and that's why there's an address column over to the left. The Kim1 has a chunk of free RAM at hex 200, so I'm choosing to begin my program there. There's no such thing as a label in machine code, so you'll notice there's no equivalent on the machine language side for the start label that's on the assembly language side. Labels all get thrown away when you convert from assembly to machine language, and that's going to be an important thing to be aware of later in the video when we talk about disassembly. The LDX opcode is converted to its hex value of A2, and the only operand of LDX is the value zero. How do you know the LDX opcode is A2? We either happen to have all the opcodes memorized, and frankly, a lot of the old school 6502 assembly language programmers did, or you can look them up. MOS Technology published this information in many places, including the 6500 series microprocessor data sheets. I'm going to refer to Appendix B of the Kim1 Programs Manual, which provides an alphabetic listing of 6502 instructions by mnemonic. 
Turn a few pages to find the LDX instruction, and there you'll find that the hex opcode for LDX is A2. Starting on the second line, I set the address to hex 202. In machine language, you have to calculate the number of bytes that each instruction takes so you know the location of the next instruction. The LDX instruction consumed two bytes, hex 200 and hex 201. So the next byte of our program is at hex 202. BD is the opcode for using LDA with absolute indexed addressing, and that requires a 16-bit address as an operand. You can see where the data label lives on our assembly code on the right ends up corresponding to address 020F on the left in our machine code. So that's the operand I provided for the LDA opcode. On the location hex 205, the BEQ opcode is F0. All branches are relative, and with machine language you have to calculate your own branches. The operand here is 8 because the branch is to the end label at 020E, which is 8 bytes ahead in memory from 205. At hex 207, the JSR opcode is hex 20, and I had to go to the Kim1 manual to look up the address of the ALTCH kernel routine. It lives at 1EA0, so that's what's specified as the operand instead of the ALTCH label like I used in the assembly code. Location 020B, I used E8, which is the opcode for INX. The jump and break are fairly self-explanatory, and then all the hello world data follows in ASCII format. Done. So the machine language you see on the left is what the processor actually runs. The assembly language on the right is what we use to write our code. The process of converting assembly language to machine language is called assembling. I think it's fairly evident, even from this simple walkthrough, why folks wrote assembler programs to do this instead of doing it by hand. I'll show you this Hello World code running on a real Kim 1, not because it adds to the learning experience, but because it's fun. Let's review. The process of converting your assembly language source code into machine language that a processor can execute is called assembly. Disassembly is when you convert machine code into assembly language source code. Just like I mentioned how folks wrote assemblers to make that job easier, there are quite a few 6502 disassemblers available also. Here's a list from Mike Nabarezny's 6502.org. I said this video would show you how I disassembled Space Invaders for the pet, but I'm not going to be using any of these disassemblers. Instead, I'm going to disassemble it mostly by hand so I can walk you through how it works. I'll cheat slightly by using the vice monitors disassemble command, so before I start on Space Invaders, I'll convert our Kim 1 example to run on the Commodore PET, then I can show you how I'll use vice monitor with that example code, and you'll see its limitations. The memory layout of the PET is different than the Kim one, so I'll set the origin address to hex 0401 instead of hex 0200. The PET kernel routines differ from the Kim one also. Hex FFD2 is the care out kernel routine on the PET. Incidentally, I could have used text here instead of byte, and it would have been a lot easier to type, but oh well. I did the assembly by hand for the Kim 1 code. I'm going to use 64 tasks to assemble the pet binary. That didn't take long at all. Now I'll use the C1541 utility that comes with the vice emulator to write the hello world PRG file to a D64 disk image that I can load into the XPET emulator. <laughs> 
Next Pet launches the Vice Pet emulator. Then I attach the disk image that I just created so I can load the Hello World example. Ten twenty five is the decimal equivalent of hex zero four zero one, so sys ten twenty five will execute our Hello World program. With our program in memory, I'll launch the vice monitor and run the D or disassemble command, giving the start address of hex 0401. Here you see the output from the vice disassembler. On the left is the original machine code, and on the right is the output of the disassembly, which is assembly language. Let's take a closer look at the assembly language output. It looks like vice handled the code section just fine. I'll put the example Kim1 assembly language source we started with on the screen so we can compare that with the assembly created by Vice. You can see that Vice did a perfect disassembly for all the actual code from our start to end labels. Remember when I said that labels are thrown away when code is assembled in the machine language? Because of that, the Vice disassembler has no way of putting labels in the disassembled source. So start, loop, end, data, and outch are all physical addresses. After the break instruction at our end label, which is 040F in machine language, you can see what happened. Vice doesn't know that's a hello world data string, and it just kept chugging right along, disassembling it as if it were code. This isn't a knock on the Vice disassembler. It's not intended to be used to disassemble entire programs and separate code from data. It's just a helpful tool that's part of the monitor you can use to disassemble small chunks of code if you're debugging while using the monitor. I'm just about ready to begin disassembling Space Invaders. The last thing I need to show you before I get started is Commodore's PRG file format so you'll understand how you know where in memory to look so you can begin disassembly. I'll use C1541 again to extract the Invaders PRG file from the D64 disk archive. And I can use the hex dump program to show you the PRG file in hex format. Commodore's PRG format is incredibly simple. The first two bytes of the file are the load address, low byte followed by high byte. Space Invaders just loads at the start of BASIC on the pet, so you see the first two bytes are 0104, which will cause the Commodore BASIC 4 DLOAD command to load Space Invaders into memory at hex 0401. Now I can start with Space Invaders. I'll launch XPET and attach the Space Invaders D64 disk image. Listing the program shows a basic program that calls sys1039. This will cause basic to go to address decimal 1039 and begin executing whatever code it finds there. Let's activate the vice monitor and start looking around. I'll start the disassembly at the PRG file's load address, which was 0401, which happens to be the start of BASIC on this pet. What's really sitting at 0401 is a BASIC program, but the vice disassembler doesn't know that. It attempts to disassemble the tokenized BASIC code, which results in essentially garbage assembly from 0401 to 040E. The actual invader's machine language code begins at hex 040F, and we know that because of the sys1039, which is 040F in hex. So I'm going to run the disassembler beginning at 040F now. This begins the actual disassembly of Space Invaders. I'm going to run the Vice Disassembler and manually copy and paste the output into a text editor until I have all the code assembled. I'll get started by moving a new terminal window down here and launching a text editor. <laughs> 
Then I start to copy and paste code generated by the Vice Disassembler. But remember from my Hello World example that the Vice Disassembler isn't aware of following branches or separating data from code. That means that I'll need to be aware of those things. I know I can trust the Vice Disassembler on discrete blocks of code, so the way I can work is to only copy and paste from a known code starting point up until that code path ends with a JMP instruction, a BRK instruction, or an RTS instruction. JMP will jump to another code execution path, BRK ends execution, RTS is the return from subroutine instruction. Any of these instructions effectively result in the end of a known code path. Here, I know the code starts at hex 040F. That's where BASIC begins the execution, so I can start copying at 04F. Now, where do I stop copying? I look for the first JMP, BRK, or RTS I encounter, and I stop there. Scrolling down, I see a JMP here at 0445, so I copy, then I paste over in my text editor. That's the beginning of my disassembly. I need to find all the code though, and I only got this one tiny block. The way I find the rest of the code is by manually following every branch instruction, then disassembling the code at each branch destination address. I'll show you what I mean. Looking at the code, the first branch I encounter is this BNE0428. That branches to hex 0428. But there's nothing for me to disassemble here though because we already have the code path at 0428 disassembled. Moving on, there's another BNE0428. Ah, and now we encounter JSR FFE4. That's a new code path, but it's also one we don't need to follow and disassemble. Let's look at a pet memory map so I can explain why. This is a pet memory map taken from page 391 of Compute's Programming the Pet slash CBM by Rato Colin West. It gets a little dicey due to pets coming in different configurations with different RAM sizes, screen sizes, ROM options, basic versions. This map does a pretty good job of generalizing it though. Generally speaking, code paths that we'll want to follow will be in RAM, and you can see that lives from hex 0000 to hex 8FFF on the left. The stuff on the right from hex 9000 to hex FFFF is going to be things like ROM code and I.O. devices. Calls from the Space Invader code to these locations aren't things we'll need to disassemble. They're standard pet system locations that may be used by the Space Invader's code though. For example, the JSR to hex FFE4 which prompted this look at the pet memory map jumps to the get in subroutine in the kernel ROM code which reads keyboard input. Back to the RAM side, notice that screen RAM starts at hex 8000. We also aren't going to find code living there. But before you embark on a disassembly, it's a good idea to understand the memory map of the system so when you begin tracing through the code, you'll have an idea of what's going on. Back to the disassembly. I left off here at this JSR FFE4 looking for code paths that we need to follow and disassemble. The next branch is to 0436, which is already disassembled, then another call to FFE4 in the kernel. This one branches to 043B, which is already disassembled right up here. Another kernel call to FFD2. Finally, the last instruction we copied is a code path we have to follow, JMP to 19D8. We have to follow that jump, so I'll disassemble that now. Now we copy this code path until we hit the first BRK, RTS, or JMP. Then we follow every branch in this new block of code. Lather, rinse, repeat. It's an extremely time-consuming process. So now we have four more we have to follow. 0E00, 0520. We don't have to follow 19E3 because it just goes right down there. We do have to follow 1900 and 1617. So I'll start by disassembling 0E00 now. And then I don't actually see anywhere where the code logically breaks in one screen, so I'll tell disassemble to get a little bit more of the code and see if we find a return. There we go. So we want to copy everything from here the whole way up to 0E00. Then paste that over into our text editor. Making good progress.
With quite a few hours of effort, I painstakingly followed every code path that could result from a user running Space Invaders from its start address. But I might not be done yet. What other code could there be? Interrupt handling code. The Commodore PET CPU is the MOS 6502. The 6502 is designed to allow it to be interrupted by external circuitry using the IRQ or interrupt request pin or the NMI or non-maskable interrupt pin. It can also be interrupted via software using the BRK or break instruction. When an interrupt takes place, the 6502 finishes its current instruction, pushes its program counter and status register on the stack, and jumps to a memory location in ROM pointed to by the interrupt vector. The PET kernel is designed to allow user programmable routines to execute from interrupts also, and page 394 of Computes Programming the PET slash CBM shows the user settable IRQ, BRK, and NMI vectors at hex 90, 92, and 94. Knowing this, I need to start looking at the Space Invaders code that I already began disassembling to see if there are any instances of storing an address at hex 90, 92, or 94. I'll search for 90 in my text editor and see what I find. That's just the address 0490, so nothing I need to think about. Ah, but here's an example I do care about. It's a 16-bit address being stored, so low byte FD at hex 90 and high byte 09 at hex 91. This will cause the routine at 09FD to execute each time an IRQ interrupt fires. Then down here, E455. I don't need to follow that one because it's in ROM. It's actually the default IRQ location, so I guess Space Invaders code must have a reason to restore the default IRQ routine. There's another one here, 19A0. Finally, at the routine starting here at hex 0530, it stores 1750 at the IRQ vector and 19F6 at the BRK vector. So I've got more starting addresses to disassemble and code paths to follow. 09FD, 19A0, 1750, and 19F6. Now I've got all the Space Invaders code, but I'm not done with the disassembly yet. I really haven't accomplished anything more than converting the opcodes back into mnemonics. If I wanted to come down here and maybe add a new feature to the code, there are a few problems. First, I'd have to move all the code down three bytes. So 0418 would change to 041B. 041A would change to 041D, and so on. Now that might not be so bad, but then down here, BNE0428 would need to change also. In fact, every single branch in the entire program would need to be updated. The way to deal with that is to make the code relocatable. For starters, turn every address into a label. Using 0428 as an example, I'll go to address 0428 in my text editor and simply change it to be L0428. In my earlier Hello World example, I used descriptive labels like start and loop. I can't do that with the Space Invaders code because I don't yet know what any of the code does. So I'll use generic labels now, and I could always go back and substitute meaningful labels later. So L for label and what the address was, 0428. Then I need to do a global search and replace of $0428 and change that to L0428 to update every branch to this address. You can see that VI updated these two instances of $0428 and I can do a search to confirm none were missed. Now I'll do the same for every address that's called as a subroutine, jump to, or branch to. I've gone through and updated every branch in the Space Invaders code to use a label instead of an address. Now to be clear, I didn't update calls into the kernel to use labels yet. I'll get to that later. I'll just do a quick scroll through so you can see the current state of things. Back to the beginning of the file and I'll start doing some cleanup. All the addresses that were branched to have been replaced by labels, so now I can remove any addresses that are left. Using VI as an editor is handy because it lets me do search and replace using regular expressions. I'll do a little scroll here to show you what things look like now. Also, I'll get rid of the machine language code on the lines where I added labels. 
back to the beginning of the file again. At this point, I expect that the code should assemble, so I'll add a start label and provide an origin address for the assembler. The code should be somewhat relocatable now, but if I don't provide an origin address, 64 tasks will default to zero. And just like with my earlier Hello World example, I'm going to assemble Space Invaders using 64 tasks. And again, I'll use C1541 to write the PRG file to a D64 disk image. LS shows the invaders assembly source that I'm working from, the new invaders D64 disk image I just created using C1541, the invaders PRG file that 64 tasks created, and the original Space Invaders disk image that I started with. I'll attach the new disk image and then try to run it and see what happens. I have no expectation that anything is going to work here because so far I've only identified the Space Invaders code. I haven't done anything to identify the data from the Space Invaders PRG file. I assume this is the initial screen that's rendering here. It should be showing us how to get sound from the pet and waiting for a key press, but there's no screen data for it to render, so we're seeing whatever happens to be in memory. I should be able to confirm that by launching the vice monitor. I'll use next, which will show us the subroutine entry points rather than step, which would show every instruction. That'll give me a quick high level view into what the code's doing. So, it's calling the kernel routine at hex FFE4, which is the get ch routine. So, it's waiting for the user to press a key, and it's happening at 043B. Now, remember the Space Invaders code's loaded at 040F, so this is right near the beginning. I'm going to go back to the code and walk through it. The code we saw in the vice monitor is right here, but that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is this very first chunk of code. This is the code that renders the initial screen in Space Invaders. Now, why do I care about that? Because so far, we've only identified Space Invaders code and none of the data. This little routine here will allow us to locate our first chunk of data. The initialization at the top sets up indirect Y addressing that will result in reading data beginning at hex 1C00 and writing data beginning at hex 8000, which is the beginning of screen RAM. Everything written to screen RAM is displayed directly to the screen. The code is using a nested loop with the Y register controlling the inner loop, which writes 256 bytes to the screen. The outer loop is controlled by the X register, which counts down from 4. So this code will write 256 bytes to screen RAM four times, starting at hex 8000, hex 8100, hex 8200, and hex 8300, writing a total of 1024 bytes to screen RAM. We will find our first chunk of data in the original binary from hex 1C00 to hex 1FFF. I'll fire up XPET again and extract that data using the vice monitor, similar to how we grabbed all the code. I need to attach the original Space Invaders here, not the new one I just built. I'll launch the vice monitor, and to dump the memory I'll use the M command, and then give it the range we need, hex 1C00 to hex 1FFF. You're looking at the data here that renders the initial screen in Space Invaders. Now, just like with the code, I'll copy and paste this into our invaders.asm file. And this required some heavy formatting work, so I spared you that boredom and edited that part out. Not only did I format the data, but I removed the addresses and used labels instead. SCRD for screen data. Then, what the original addresses were. Just like with the code, this allows the data to be relocated.
I have to go back to the beginning and change how the code sets up the indirect addresses, since right now it's using the address 1C00. If we relocate the code, the label SCRD1C00 might not be located at address 1C00. 64 task provides this syntax that lets you specify high byte and low byte of a label. So whatever address SCRD1C00 ends up being once it's assembled, 64 task will correctly use the high byte and low byte of that address. I have to make one more change here. The original code was setting the Y register to zero and then using that for two purposes, the low byte of the indirect address and initializing the loop iterator. Since the low byte of SCRD1C00 might not be zero, I'll explicitly set the Y register to zero. I'm going to save this and assemble it, then try to run it. If I did this correctly, we'll see the opening screen of Space Invaders that tells us how to get sound out of the pet. Nothing new here, so I'm going to speed it up for you. I'll attach my newly created Space Invaders disk image this time. Load and Sys1039 to run it. Great, I correctly identified the first chunk of data. Now, much like the manual process of following all the code paths, finding data is also a boring manual process of walking through the code and looking for places where it's loading data from RAM. That was everything you need to do to manually disassemble a 6502 binary and make it relocatable. What you're looking at here is the finished disassembly of Space Invaders. Well, not finished, but the state where I left off and called it good enough. It's functionally equivalent to what you would end up with if you followed all the steps I did in this video, but I did some things to make it prettier. I added a comment block at the top, I added the basic loader so you don't have to type sys1039 to launch it, you can just type run. I added labels here for the kernel routines, I added labels for the hardware and I.O. locations, then I added labels for all the zero page locations that are used by the code. I used labels for the interrupt vector locations, I even added all these M labels for random memory addresses that are used by the code. None of this is required, it just makes the code easier to read. I'll put a download link in the description of the video so you can look at this disassembly if you want. It builds using 64 tasks, just like you saw me type in the video several times. The moment you've all been waiting for. I'm gonna run a newly assembled Space Invaders created from the disassembled source code. It looks like it generally works here, and that's fantastic. But I haven't done a whole lot of testing with it yet, so there could still be bugs in my disassembled version. If you find any, let me know. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.